Welcome to Musings from Marlage. Um, so I've made some promises over the last couple of months and I've been struggling to keep those. I, I told everybody that I was going to do a season preview for everybody on USC's 2023 schedule. Uh, and then when it became clear I wasn't gonna do that, largely because a lot of those teams were just garbage and nobody wanted to listen to it, I said, okay, I'm gonna do a preview only for the five big games on the schedule. I gave you Utah, I had four more to do. Then today I look at it, I realize there are only two more weeks and I have four more games. So I either break my promise to you, which I'm not gonna do, or I keep my promise, but we're gonna have to do it a little bit differently. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, I'm gonna combine these, these four games into the two natural pairs. I'm gonna deal with Oregon and Washington today. And then next week, I'm gonna do UCLA and Notre Dame in a combined rivalry preview. Uh, I'm gonna be out of the country next week. So that's gonna come from some sort of exotic location. I have some ideas in mind for that, uh, but uh, you'll just have to wait and see. In the meantime, Oregon and Washington today. Look, here's the thing. Everybody knows what happened with Oregon and Washington recently. We all know that they got bids to join the Big Ten, and now Oregon and Washington are our two newest Big Ten rivals. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows what I think about that. And I don't want to go on a long tirade today. I don't want to go. I know you guys think that you, you, you push the button, you say Oregon, and then a tirade comes out. And that's true sometimes, but I don't want to do that anymore if I can avoid it. So I'm just going to say this. Yes, I'm disappointed. I thought there was a real opportunity to kick Oregon out of the car on the side of the road in the desert without water and just leave them there as the buzzard circled overhead. I thought that they would die a painful and lonely death and I was looking forward to watching that. I was going to turn on my television at 11 p.m. on a Saturday to watch them play San Diego State in some new Pac-12 nonsense matchup, and I was going to enjoy it. And now I don't get to enjoy that, and I'm disappointed. Here's the good news. While we're not gonna get to watch Oregon die that way, the fact that they're in the Big Ten means that they're gonna survive. The fact that they still have Uncle Phil's money and they hand out big, big bags of cash to high school recruits means they're still going to be relevant. But it also means that a motivated USC led by a real coach will have a chance to beat up on Oregon. And a motivated USC led by a real coach always has a better program than Oregon. It doesn't mean they won't win from time to time. Of course they will. But for the most part, we're going to hand it to them over and over and over again. And so that's what we have to look forward to. There's nothing wrong with that. As for Washington, I've got no beef with you. You belong in the Big Ten. And so let's start there. Let's start our preview with Washington because I like them more. And for good reason, Washington is traditionally the second best program in the Pac-12. UCLA fans might squawk a little bit, but it's true. Uh, the only thing UCLA has over Washington is they have one Heisman Trophy. Washington has zero, but let's be honest, Gary Beaven was the worst Heisman winner of all time. OJ clearly should have won it that year. And so let's just call it half a Heisman. Half a Heisman doesn't overcome the fact that Washington has Washington has a better program in terms of winning percentage, in terms of conference titles, Rose Bowls, Rose Bowl wins, all that stuff. Washington is better. If you can judge people by their enemies, Washington is hated by Oregon and hates Oregon. Also, a good point in their favor. And even if everything else was very, very close between Washington and UCLA for number two in the conference, um, Washington was still in the tiebreaker because Washington's uniforms and mascot do not, unlike UCLA, look like they were prepared, planned, put together by a group of 13-year-old cheerleaders. And so if for that reason alone, Washington should win. Now, let's not get too excited about this. Being the second best program in the Pac-12 doesn't mean all that much. That's like... That's like having the, uh, you know, the second best song from the band who did Macarena. 
I mean, I, I'm sure they have a second song, but nobody knows what that song is and nobody really cares. Um, it's like being the second biggest celebrity ever to come out of Tupelo, Mississippi. The gap between Elvis and whoever's number two is so enormous that you shouldn't brag about being number two. Nonetheless, Washington's number two. That's why we're going to talk about them right now. By the way, and I know I can't get away from the topic, and I know that people are going to accuse me of ranting, but listen. There's a reason why number two doesn't matter very much in the Pac-12. Not like it would in the, in the Big 12 or the Big 10 or the SEC, where there have always been at least two power programs. I mean, the Big 12 doesn't have any now, but they did. Uh, and, and, and it's only in the Pac-12 where the gap between number one and number two is so enormous. A few years ago, they did an all-century team for Pac-12 football. Go check it out. It came out in, it was probably seven years ago, eight years ago. They named 50 players to the all-century team for Pac-12 football. 25 were from USC. Literally half the team was from USC. And I think Washington had two, maybe three, and they're the second best program. That's what I'm talking about. The gap between USC and its Pac-12 foes historically has been crazy big. USC has 11 national championships, eight since World War II. Since World War II, Washington has one national title, UCLA has one. Oregon, obviously, of course, has zero. Everybody else has zero. Uh, you're just talking about a gigantic gap, which makes this whole, this whole Pac-12 debacle just weird. This idea that the Pac-12 presidents would get together and say, oh, we don't need USC. What's the big deal? We'll just go ahead and have our own conference. It'll be great. We'll sign a TV deal. Boom. Face plant. Conference implodes. I can't even get through the sentence. It just happened that fast. It, it never made any sense. It's just ridiculous. Um, so whatever. We're moving on to the Big Ten. Washington and Oregon are come, gonna come with us and, uh, and Oregon will start taking their beatings. Back to Washington. I was supposed to be talking about them. All right. Washington was a power under Don James. You probably remember this from the mid seventies until uh, until sometime in the early uh, sometime in the early nineties. Um, Washington had one of the best teams in the history of the Pac twelve in nineteen ninety one. Obviously, uh, they won the national title. Steve Entman was uh, was was the big name, maybe, but there were a lot of great players on that team. Mark Brunel, Napoleon Kaufman, Lincoln Kennedy. That was an incredible football team. And the Huskies now are back on the ascent. Um, USC wasn't the only team with an amazing turnaround last year. Washington also went from four and eight to 11 wins. And like USC, they did it behind a star quarterback. Like USC, that quarterback is coming back this year. Michael Penix Jr. threw for 4,641 yards last year. A monster season. This kid can play. If he stays healthy, I don't think there's any doubt he's going to have a big season again this year. But that's the thing with Penix. Penix hasn't been able to stay healthy until last year. In the four years before that, all of which were at the University of Indiana, unfortunately for Penix, uh, he got hurt every single year. He never played more than six games. He had four season-ending injuries, and two, including two ACL tears. If Penix is healthy, Washington is going to score a bunch of points and be very difficult to beat. If he's not healthy, that changes everything about their season. You know, he's got a good supporting cast. Um, he has a fantastic group of returning receivers. I think USC's re receiving core this year is going to have incredible depth, but a lot of people rank Washington's ahead of USC's. That's a good crew. Uh, he's going to have a couple of good edge rushers, and Washington has balance. They're not an amazing rushing team. But they were a good rushing team last year, more than enough to, uh, to force you to respect it, keep you honest. Washington also has one of the great home field advantages in college football. Uh, in fact, it's one of the great settings for college football. Uh, that place gets loud, the crowd gets into it. It's a very difficult place to play. Unfortunately for the Huskies, they'll be playing at the Coliseum this year. Washington is 11 and 32 all time at the Coliseum, which really isn't very good. The Huskies are going to score points this year. Uh, and they'll make some plays defensively. They have some guys on that side of the ball. This is a good team. This is a preseason top 10 team for a reason. 
I just don't think they can win in the Coliseum. That is a really tall order. You're going to have to figure out a way to slow down Caleb Williams and what I think will be a much improved USC defense and beat them at their place. I just don't see that happening. If this game was in Seattle, I think Seattle, I think the, the Huskies would be a favorite. At the Coliseum, I just don't think so. I, I like USC. I like USC in that game. Now, let's turn our attention to the Oregon Ducks. Unlike Washington, Oregon has not been a Pac-12 power historically. What Oregon is, is an experiment. And actually, it's a pretty fascinating one. So you take a program that is nothing and has nothing. Look, between 1950, what is it, 1957 and 1991, Oregon won a single conference championship. From Ike to George W. Bush, they won a single conference title. That is flat out embarrassing. That's who they were. They've been terrible forever. And there's nothing really uh, that, that they have to sell. They can't sell the academics of, of, of Stanford or Cal or USC or UCLA. They can't, they don't have uh, a, a natural recruiting base. They don't have a, a tradition. They don't have anything. And this is what makes the experiment fascinating because Phil Knight came in and said, all right, I've got a program that is worth nothing and has done nothing. What happens if I give them an unlimited budget and an incredible marketing team? And the truth is, the results came out pretty good. Look, Uncle Phil's checkbook and the marketing people did not turn Oregon into Ohio State or Oklahoma or Alabama or Notre Dame or USC or Michigan or Texas. They did not become a blue blood. They are not at that level. They will never be at that level because there is a ceiling beyond which it's difficult for a program like Oregon uh, to, to get. But what they turned into, look, but they were Indiana essentially for years and years and years. And they went from being Indiana to being a whole lot better in Indiana. I mean, they're, they're relevant now. The, you know, ESPN and college football writers will talk about them. People will watch their games, their games matter. That is a massive accomplishment. It really is. And I hate Oregon. And I always talk about how I hate Oregon. But let's not kid ourselves. Oregon, ha Oregon is one of the few programs that has gone from absolute dog meat to a legitimate second tier program. Much the way Kansas State did under Bill Snyder. Now, Kansas State was all about substance. There was no flash. There was no style. Uh, and Oregon is more sizzle than steak most of the time. But look. They've done it. They've gone from absolute nothing to, uh, to a legitimate program. And, and the truth is that they're going to be difficult this year. So let's start with Bo Nix. I was wrong about Bo Nix. I, I, I wrote at WeRSC. I came on this. Uh, I, I came on and did videos for WeRSC that, uh, that are on YouTube. You can still watch them where I said that Bo Nix was terrible. I watched him play at Auburn a few different times, and I thought the guy simply couldn't play. I was wrong. That guy can play. He can make plays with his feet. He can make plays with his arm. He is a problem, and he's going to be a, an especially big problem at Autzen. Uh, Bo Nix, I, I think Oregon was in the top five in just about every major offensive category last year. Uh, they, they probably will be again this year. Bo Nix is a stud. And while Oregon has to revamp their offensive line, they've recruited so well along the offensive line, I don't think they're going to struggle to do that. The running backs are good, especially Bucky Irving, who is, uh, who is a monster. A wide receiver Troy Franklin is a star. Oregon's going to score a bunch of points. They're going to be really good offensively. The question with Oregon is whether they can play defense. Now, the funny thing is that Oregon's coaching staff has been running around telling all the recruits that that's where you go if you want to be developed. These guys haven't proven anything like that. I mean, the defensive coordinator at Oregon, Tasha Lapui, is a fantastic recruiter and has been for many years. He wasn't good enough to stay defensive coordinator at Alabama. He was fired because he just wasn't that good with the X's and O's. Uh, Dan Lanning had a very nice run as a defensive coordinator at Georgia. But look, the head coach at Georgia is a defensive specialist and is just fine without Dan Lanning. 
So I don't know how much credit we give him. I mean, it feels a little bit like a potential Charlie Weiss situation where you have a former coordinator running around taking credit for something that's really not his to take credit for. It would be almost like Nick Holt running around taking credit for USC's 2008 defense, which was spectacular, when the reality is that Pete Carroll recruited those guys and, uh, and is a defensive genius in a way that Nick Holt never was. Sure, Holt did a good job. I'm not trying to demean Holt. I'm just saying, in a situation like that, the head coach gets the credit. Kirby Smart is a defensive genius. Kirby Smart has built Georgia. Dan Lanning, Dan Lanning, I'm sure, did fine. But Georgia's okay without him. So the, the Oregon coaching staff has been talking up their great defensive bona fides, but I'm not sure... I'm not sure there's substance there. I know this, last year Oregon's defense was very mediocre. Are they gonna be better this year? Maybe, it's year two. It's year two in the system. They got, some, uh, they got some transfer portal guys to come in to fill some spots, including an edge rusher. Are they gonna be better? Maybe, maybe. They're gonna be tough at Autzen regardless because, look, let's be honest about what Autzen is. It's a small stadium that's made to contain the noise. They then take 55,000 of the worst people in the world and they liquor them up and they throw them in those seats and the place is a madhouse. It's like being in, in Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome or something. You're surrounded by misfits that are, that are probably high on drugs and they're screaming and yelling at you. That's a tough situation to be in, tough place to play. They're gonna be difficult there. The question is whether Oregon's going to be any more than that. Because Oregon has games at Utah, at Washington. They still have that Oregon State team, which absolutely pounded them in the fourth quarter last year, just physically took it to them. So Oregon's got a lot, of, a lot else on their schedule. But for USC fans, we know we have to go to Autzen, which is a tough place to play. The week before that game, Oregon essentially gets a bye week. They're playing Cal. Cal's not gonna be very good. Uh, USC the week before the Oregon game gets Washington and they have Utah and Notre Dame just a couple weeks before that. This is going to come near the end of this brutal death march that USC has the second half of the season. A, a, a fresh USC team on a neutral field that's healthy, I think beats Oregon by two touchdowns. I just think, I think USC is, is a better football team. But a, a USC team that's not rested, that's not healthy, that's playing on the road at one of the toughest venues there is, that, that's going to be a dogfight. So I, I think I probably call that the toughest game of the year. Notre Dame is a better team than Oregon, but USC has six cakewalk games before they face Notre Dame. They're going to be healthy. They're going to be hungry. I like that matchup for USC, even though I think Notre Dame is going to be really good this year. Oregon, I don't think, is going to be quite as good as Notre Dame, but uh, that game is going to be a monumental challenge. So, um, all right, I think that's it. Um, I don't want to talk anymore about Oregon. I'm tired of Oregon. Uh, next week, next week, we're going to talk about the two big ones. I told you I'm, I'm going to come from some foreign destination. We'll see if I can do something creative with that. We're going to talk about the two rivals. We're going to talk about... UCLA, we're going to talk about Notre Dame. We're going to talk about all the things that we think, all the things we feel, all the things we fear when it comes to these two rivals. The games against Notre Dame and UCLA every year are the two biggest games on the schedule. They're the games that really define the program. The, the Bush push game, the, the 74 comeback, um, the, the 64, the 64, uh, uh, the 64 game where USC throws the pass at the end of the game to beat a number one Irish team. These are the games that make a program. Uh, you, uh, uh, you know, OJ versus Beban, uh, Rodney Pete versus Troy Aikman. I mean, this is it. And so I'm going to talk a lot about that. We're going to talk about the curse of Cade. We're going to talk about the comeback. We're going to talk about Fat Charlie. We're going to talk about Lazy Chip Kelly. Uh, we're going to talk about all this stuff. We're going to get it all out there. We're going to be very we're going to be very honest next week in musings, and we're going to walk through what these rivalry games mean and what USC fans should be thinking about. Um, all right, so that's next week. I hope you join me for that. Have a good week. I'll see you then. Until next week, fight on.